Hi, and welcome to episode number seven of What Sex Got to Do With It with my favorite 84 <laughs> year old great grandmother, first time. Well, not, not, no, it's actually not first time author, right? No, this, this is, I've written a lot more books than I've had published, but this is the third book I've had published by right. a traditional publisher. Right, 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 right. So, and, and now I'm kind of recalling a little bit that we talked about that in one of the earlier episodes, so you have to go back and see that conversation, folks. But this one's called Sex on the Brain. <laughs> Why? Why? Well, because as a species, we certainly do have sex on the brain. I mean, in part, that's because of our continuous sexual re receptivity. That's one of the things that sets us apart from, from other species. I mean, but seriously, do we have to know? About, I mean, I know, I've heard descriptions when Donald Trump was president of his penis. I mean, really, do we have to have that kind of information? I'm also puzzled why various political figures have to be identified by their sexual orientation. Oh, this is our first openly gay whatever. Right. We're just absolutely fascinated with other people's sex lives in ways that sometimes seem to me inappropriate. I mean, I really would rather not have read a description of Donald Trump's penis. I wish I'd never, never gone there. Um, so we are a species that is very, we have a lot of non-reproductive sex. Uh, and um, so, <laughs> so, uh, so the woman who's written a book with the word sex in the title yeah. is protesting <laughs> our obsession with sex. I mean, what can I say? But uh, it, it is, it, the, the, the older I get, Len, I begin to feel alienated from my own species. Sometimes I look at us as if I'm a species from another planet, and I think, who are, what is this species, Homo sapiens? Right. I, and there was a, an author that I really like, Adam um, Rutherford, who wrote a book called it, the. It was first published in the UK. I forget what the UK title was, but when it was published in the United States, it, they changed the title to Humanimal, which I don't think is yeah. a very good title. He's the one who made the point of how much sexual activity there is that does not result in babies. So we're much, much, much better at having sex without having children than we are at having sex and producing offspring. So there's a lot of... Um, sexual behavior that's unrelated to reproduction in humans. So, uh, well, so that's, that's, that's interesting. So do you think that is a function of birth control? No. Ooh, interesting. No, not at all. But we would I, have more babies if there wasn't birth control, though, right? Um, I'm not sure. The women I interviewed in, introduced birth control use when they met a man with whom they wanted to have children. It's like that was the moment when they suddenly could picture themselves pregnant when they first began to think babies, and then they initiated birth control. So use. then, were they not having sex then before? Oh, they were having sex. But then, yes. how were they avoiding having kids if they weren't? Well, using? that's you know the high. For me, my explanation: the high self-esteem that accompanies um, ovulation. Um, but I don't really know. I mean, that's that that's really a wild speculation on my part. So mm. I shouldn't even talk about it. But. Um, no, that's the continuous sexual receptivity right. that came along with yeah. the, the mutation that created right. uh, concealed ovulation. And it's a very good pair bonding right. mechanism. Right. I mean, it's a very good pair bonding right. mechanism. Um, so it, it definitely has, it's advantageous. But we are, as, as a species, there, we have a lot of sexual activity totally disconnected from reproduction, except that if it create, helps create pair bonds, then it contributes to the successful rearing of the children that right. you have. Right, right, right. So, I, you know, there are just certain words I can't put together in a sentence, you know. And I, couldn't, I didn't imagine the conversation going here at <laughs> Sorry all. Sorry about you know, that, Len. You know, so I'm going to ask it in a way without putting together a certain sequence of words, but you'll know what I'm talking about. Well, this is, I'm, okay. I'm bracing myself sure. over here. <laughs> so, so why is it you felt compelled to read a description of a certain ex-president's 
generals. I mean, like, I, I, because I, me, it's like if I saw that, it's like there's no way I'm reading that. You know, I'm just I'm just not gonna read it. You I, know, I, I, I'm a compulsive reader. I subscribe to a lot of like to to um, the Atlantic, to Harper's, to the New Yorker. I subscribe to three national r newspapers. I skim through them quickly every yeah. day. So I just yeah. get exposed to a lot of information and that whole Stormy Daniels saga. Yeah, right, 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 right. That's, uh, you know, she's right. the one that came out with the, right. the description. I wasn't reading to get that description. It right. just happened. It just happened. It just yeah, happened before you to do be, it. Before you be, do be, it before, and then I I'm got thinking, you. Oh, I got God. you. Before you know it, that, that paragraph yeah. is in front of you. I know. You know and I, I am I am always curious about yeah. things. I mean, yeah. in all those magazines, yeah. newspapers, et cetera, yeah. that I scan and read every day. You know, I get it. I'm very interested always in anything related to courtship reproduction. Yeah, I get it. So I get exposed, uh, you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, I'm, I, I'm just interested in yeah, that stuff. I think, I think if I were reading a story and I wasn't expecting that, but then that was the next paragraph, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to skip it. You know, and then and then I have an image in my mind that I'm stuck with, you know, and, and, and I guess I need some kind of a drug, me, <laughs> to, to that way. <laughs> okay, now now I'm going to tell a story that, that I'm glad my son will not be watching this. And, you know, talking about my, always my interest in courtship and and reproduction and and genetics. When I was teaching school, when my son was a toddler, he was not yet in school. I'm glad a friend of mine was the one who babysat him while I was off teaching. So he was out playing with the other kids in front of the house, and there was a ditch along the road. It was a road with no traffic. This is when right. we lived outside of Kansas City. We were in Missouri. And someone had thrown a pornographic magazine into the ditch. And my friend Vera, who was the babysitter, she came out and saw the kids with that magazine, she said, oh my goodness, give that to me, I'll throw it away. And Craig, my son, said, oh no, you can't throw it away. You have to save it for my mother. She's really interested in stuff like that. So <laughs> there we have it. So, so how old was he then? Oh, preschool. He wasn't yet <laughs> in school. Save it for my mother. She's really interested in stuff like that. So I'm so, so glad if it was a friend uh, because anyone else would not have relayed that story back to me. Vera and I found it hysterically yeah, yeah. funny. But that's just an indication even my kids picked up on the fact, I don't know, just interested in, in courtship in all species. Right. Really, I always was. Yeah, no, no, I got you. That, it's all so... Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I get the contacts, meet a few, and, and, and I think finally I've met someone who I think has more curiosity than I do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> or the wrong kind of curiosity, oh, no, 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 there's nothing wrong about it at all. Uh, and then I'm, uh, so, um, and it's more, it's more of my, um, well, yeah, we'll just leave, leave the rationale um, behind. You know, so, so, coming to the beginning of the chapter, you know, you say that most of them say that while women should have the same opportunities as men to work or participate in politics. They should do more homemaking and child rearing. And that leads me to ask you, what kind of homes do you think we would have and how would children be different if the roles were reversed, if men did the homemaking and child rearing? Well, I, well, and of course, increasingly, I mean, there are men who described as what, house husbands, is yeah, that uh -huh. what they call themselves? Um, you know, it, we're moving toward that, and my, I would actually like to see more shared domestic labor uh, between the, the male and female parent, um, or even, you know, I don't know how it is in, in, um, in gay couples, whether the division of labor is as acute as it is in heterosexual, um, couples, but I think that we really need more economic equality before that's ever going to happen. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I think it would be great. I, you know, go back, you don't even know, you know, when we were an agrarian, more an agrarian economy, there was more shared labor between men and women then. Yeah. And like women would be out in the fields, the children would come too. So women, I think, had more power in a way in those kinds of communities. Now where we work away from home, and we'll see after this um, 
you know, the quarantine and right. the pandemic and people working from home. Yeah. I think the general consensus is, though, that that has been much harder on women yeah. than it, has, yeah. than it yeah. has on men. Yeah, it makes me wonder if there are any studies, I mean, on, on gay couples, I mean, and, and the vision of labor in, in the household. I, there, there have been, but I, I'm not, I mean, I've, again, in reading all these things yeah. I skim through, I'm not confident enough to describe the, role, uh, right. the results. Yeah, generally I find relationships, I mean, that people do the role in the relationship that they are good at or that they prefer. I mean, and so, so the division of labor generally isn't equal. I mean, if you were like to say, oh, well, you know, you put this amount of time into effort, so it's like time, time multiplied by effort, I mean, for all the things that are done in a relationship aren't gonna end up being equal. They're not know? gonna be completely equal. Uh -huh. and but not even close. So I'm not even saying I'm not even saying that it's not equal, you know. But I'm thinking it's probably not even close, you know. So that one is just going to be good at certain kinds of tasks that have either either require greater effort, you know, or more time, or both, you know. So that's just my hypothesis, you know. Yeah. But and of course, to get back to the biology uh. of it all, once sexual selection evolved as opposed to asexual selection, that's the original division of labor right there. And uh, the sociobiologist used to have an expression which, you know, again, these expressions give an overview, but I'm not recommending them, but they do explain something, and that is sperm is cheap, eggs are expensive. Right, right. And so the female has the scarce resource, which right. is the egg. She, you know, she's born with all the eggs she'll ever produce in right. her lifetime. Men produce gazillions of sperm once they reach um, sexual maturity on a regular basis. So they can sort of squander sperm and not worry. A woman, once she gets pregnant, she already has a much larger investment in this, this, uh, this little embryo. From the moment she becomes pregnant, her investment is so much larger than the man's investment. And so the person who's invested more in something becomes invested in taking care of that and so i think that and women you know the cost of pregnancy is very very high for women right. it it changes right. our bodies uh, right. it it you know it's dangerous to our health right. we tend to overlook the the physiological impact of a pregnancy on a woman and then when the baby is born now, if she's breastfeeding, and certainly the recent formula shortage is making, I think more women think about the wisdom of breastfeeding, so you have that under your control. Women are more inclined to keep investing because they already have a disproportionately heavy investment in the birth of that child. I mean, once a woman, I, I think I say in the book even, once a woman is pregnant, her reproductive machinery is essentially frozen. Certainly until the baby's born, if she's breastfeeding, breastfeeding right. often inhibits ovulation. Right. So until she weans that baby, she's not going to be able to get pregnant again, where, you know, um, theoretically, a man could impregnate a gazillion women in right. that same period of time. A gazillion. Yeah, a no, just, 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 just a lot. Yeah, yeah. Mean, yeah. So there, there's a physiological basis for that gets carried over. That doesn't mean I'm recommending it, as I hope anyone who reads my book realizes. I argue that there's an awful lot of our behavior that has a genetic or biological component that I think we need to learn to rise above. Um, and, and, and that mismatch of investment is one of the behaviors. I, but I think it'll happen only when there's economic equity, but which we do not yet have. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, so, so um, where do I go next? I mean, I have a couple ideas here. Um, I did not check your footnotes on this, I mean, so uh, I could very well answer this question myself. But just for the sake of conversation, uh, you. And one section, one paragraph, I say, why do men need women? <laughs> and you say, perhaps they need them as much for conversation as they do for sex. Mm -hmm. did, did, was there any research behind that? Or? No, that, I was quoting one of the women that I interviewed, actually, right. 
who who felt that that long quote was actually taken from my dissertation is yeah. what that was taken from was one of the women i interviewed who um she and her husband had a very tight bond uh -huh. um they were both pretty sexually adventurous but she felt the thing that kept her husband bonded to her was the fact that he could talk to her and be vulnerable in a way that he could not with anyone else and she felt that conversation uh, that was a was a more compelling bond than even sex in her case and and they had a pretty lively uh sexual relationship so but but yeah, yeah. i i remember that woman I, you know, she was just perfectly convinced of that that uh that that her husband remained faithful to her she didn't worry about him wandering because she knew that he loved to talk to her and that she was able to hear him and not judge him and 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 yeah i remember earlier you had alluded to different conversational styles between men and women yeah. and so this sort of when i was skimming through this chapter before coming up here today i thought oh that kind of harkens back to the question that 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 len raised before about whether they're different uh sort of language uh, conversational styles between men and women that woman certainly felt right. that there were you know, I'm just going to go for it. Go for it. Because this chapter is all about sex <laughs> on the brain. And so you can't just say, you know, they had kind of lively, adventurous. What was the nature of. I'm not going there. <laughs> because we don't know who they are, you know? No, so, no, so, no. no. Okay. I, I'm, not, I'm still not going there. That's, that's why. I, I, you know, the woman who is outraged that she knows uh, what a certain ex president's. Penis looks like I'm. I'm not going into detail on that particular couple. Okay, no, yeah. you know, so so I. So you tried, Len. That's fine. No, no, no. So I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine with that. You know, so, um, so now I need to change my gears a little bit. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's eighty-four-year-old so, great grandmother yeah. surprised you. She does have her limits. Right? <laughs> so, I have the occasional boundary. Um, um, my grandkids would not necessarily agree. My one little granddaughter used to say, "Oh, Babu, you're so inappropriate." <laughs> that that's totally fine, you know. And 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 actually, I mean, I I just trying to pick out me from. So so we actually kind of discussed this a little bit um, earlier, and you, know, uh, you you talked about he you know, how he, the species should try. Well, we have to. As you say, if we become so clever, we figure out how to outsmart this evolutionary push, we have effectively guaranteed our own extinction, uh, reproduce or die. You know? So... Yeah, if, we, if we never have children, if we completely rise above right. that push to have children, then, you know, the species will end. If, right. if they're, and I'm not saying that you have to reproduce. I hope people don't misunderstand me on that. I right. think people have lots of value. I mean, maybe a special value if they don't right. have their own immediate children that they're investing in. They contribute to the community. You know, they invest in nieces and nephews, other children. They make the world a better place for everybody. You don't have to reproduce to contribute mightily to who we are as a species. Right. In fact, maybe people are so intent on investing just in their own children, that's just investing in their own genes. Right. That's a kind of selfishness, you know, um, the selfish gene. Uh, uh, Richard, Daw Richard right. is that his first yeah. name, Dawkins? Yeah. Um, the selfish gene hypothesis. So I'm not saying that, that reproduction is the greatest thing but bottom line if nobody reproduced that would be the end of the line for the species but you don't have to have children to make wonderful contributions to the health of the species the immediate health of the species I totally get where you're coming from with that yeah yeah, yeah, and yeah much like when um, yeah I, I get it and, and yeah because there was another conversation where me race could have been uh, it could have been implied as part of what you were saying oh, yeah. oh, right, and, right. and that yeah. wasn't at all so yeah. so I totally yeah. get that here and, you know I was more so thinking about um, in more advanced for lack of a better word uh, societies it seems that the uh, the birth rate is below the replacement rate Wait, and that's because humans this this one of our 
to me, our primary reproductive or, and economic innovation is that we control resources symbolically. And so because of language, we create deeds, etc. Yeah. And all other species control their access to resources by defending the resources they need with their own bodies. Yeah, yeah. And since they're pretty much uniform in size and shape, yeah. there's an equitable distribution of resources. In humans, that's not true. We control our access to resources yeah. symbolically. Yeah, and we'll be talking and so about that once, a lot later. Once yeah. you are able to guarantee that the children you have give enough resources to make sure that they will mature and to reproductive age on their own, then you, you, you have very excellent reproductive success by having fewer children. In fact, I say that Darwinian's flaw, that one of Charles Darwin's major flaws was what I call his Malthusian right, yeah, right, bias. Right, right. And so this idea that, that reproductive success is measured by large numbers of children, I just don't buy that at all. Right. You know, I think he, in fact, well, maybe it's in a different chapter, so I shouldn't jump ahead. One of my favorite lines is that, um, what, I'm not going to remember it, um, confusing wealth with genetic superiority right. is right. a mistake made most often by those with great fortunes. Right, right, right. And Charles Darwin, of course, was part of the landed gentry. Right, right. So, um, no, humans, you know, it, once we have control, once we feel secure in our control of resources, we, we have fewer children. Right, but the issue I think that I'm raising though is that we have fewer than we need to replace, right? But, I mean, and that's, we're already eight billion or close to, so I'm not particularly concerned if, if those of us who are doing the most consuming, which right. is, is in terms of climate, that's a problem. If those are, who are doing the most confu consuming are not uh, achieving replacement level, I think, you know what, that might not be a bad, such a bad thing. Yeah, Nate, I hear you, I understand. And, and I'm, I'm, I was thinking that too, but I'm just wondering if a certain level, if there's like a threshold of economic prosper prosperity be that be then gets the species to a point where it's not replacing. Uh, and, you know, it, it, its birth rate is lower than its... Um, and, well, in order for that to happen, and I wish that that would happen, yeah. actually, we have to have um, equitable, economic equity spread across the, po the population of the world. And yeah, or at least a threshold of, because yeah. for me, it's more, it isn't that we have to, well, I mean, equity is a good word, because equity doesn't mean that it's equal, no. it just means that the, everyone is above the threshold where they can thrive mm -hmm. instead of desperately try to survive, mm -hmm. and, and I, I guess my question is, if you get to that threshold where you can thrive, I mean, does that m make the species vulnerable to not reproducing enough to replace it, to keep well, itself going. given that we're starting <laughs> at this point with a figure approaching eight billion, yeah. uh, uh, it, it, you know, that's a lot of people. Yeah. And, and so I, I would be, I would actually be very glad if we fell below replacement level mm -hmm. and over the generations, mm -hmm. the number of people inhabiting the planet dropped. So you think eight billion is below, above the carrying capacity of the Earth? Oh. I mean, currently, I mean, with the way that we're using the resources of the planet, well, we're you, doing, you know, do you think I, it's I'm, I'm unusual in that most people, particularly people who are secure enough economically that they've already reduced the number of children they have, most people feel that population is the greatest threat to our environment. I don't feel that, but I, I don't think we need to have eight billion of us. Gotcha. So I'd be very, I, I, you know, I, what's wrong with five or six billion? Is that the end of the world? I'd, it yeah. wouldn't be the end of the species. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was just wondering. I, mean, I don't really know what the carrying capacity of the Earth is, and I do feel though that, me right now everything is really based on increasing growth. Me, me, me. Just in general economics, at least in capitalistic societies, it's like, me, you are compounding your growth, mean, and compounding just doesn't work. 
I mean, anytime you start compounding, eventually you're going to run out of resources because you're just growing yeah. too fast. I mean, so to a certain extent, you want to transition from a compounding growth rate to a linear growth rate, but even that gets you into trouble. So at some point, you're going to need to just flatline. You're going to say, this is the limit that we can handle. And you just some, aim, some of the younger for... environmentalists are challenging this notion of growth economies. Yeah, Why yeah. do we assume that we need a growth economy? Yeah. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with them on that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, and so, I'm kind of with them on that. And so me, I, I like to know what we think is the carrying capacity, you know, and and then and then work from there. You and, know? and when you're talking about carrying capacity, as far as I'm concerned, you don't just talk about humans. It's also our impact on other species. Yes. So, yeah. um, you know, when we reach a certain level of numbers of people, we really are negatively impacting on other species. And we need those other species more yeah. than they need us. I Let's agree. Face it. We need the honeybee a lot more than the honeybee needs us. That's true. That's very true. Yeah, yeah definitely true. Yeah. Yeah, we need the the fish, you know, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I totally agree with that. So, so what I've been doing uh, is teasing people as to what the next chapter we're going to cover is going to be called, you know, and it's going to be chapter eight, first words, the evolution of language. My and favorite. You, you kind of hinted at it, you yeah. know, and, and we're, uh, we're about to take off in terms of the, where the plot of this book uh, has been leading us, I mean, and so yeah, it's been a nice I, I little, love that chapter. I love to, obviously, somebody who talks as much as I do. I love to discuss the evolution of language. Yeah, yeah. And on that, folks, me come back me for episode <laughs> number nine. Thanks for watching. I hope they're all having as much fun as you and I are, Len. <laughs> well, I think um, you didn't meet her, Cheryl. She works here.